A few men with injured feet will remain behind with the train and anti-aircraft crews. We load up our kit and on the order route march. Take off with compass and map. Now for real hardship, which will inevitably dent our enthusiasm. We start off singing, but slowly and surely this dies away. The sun gets up and it becomes warmer. At lunchtime, a longer rest is ordered. During the afternoon, the sun really beats down. We still have some reserves, and although we're very tired, we carry on well past nightfall. We just collapse to the ground in a hollow in the step, catch our breath, and then unroll our ground sheets and blankets from our kit bags. That night, we sleep like the dead. The 27th of October. This morning, my legs are as stiff as an old pack horse's, and the rest of the men are feeling no better. I eat a slice of bread and take a sip of my cold coffee. Goodness knows when I'll get something to drink again. Up and at it. The fellows up front start out at quite a rate of knots. The train company does not have that much to carry, but the rest of us are loaded down like pack animals. We carry the full kit with blanket and ground sheet, steel helmet, and heavy winter coat thrown over it. We have a full ammunition pouch on the belt, on our backs the kit bag with the field canteen, and on the other side the folded and trenching tool. A gas mask is slung around our necks, resting on the chest, and the heavy rifle swings back and forth from its strap round the neck. Lastly, a ditty bag is carried in one hand, filled with clean socks, underwear, and similar items. The whole lot weighs about 40 pounds. Time passes. Men regularly fall to the ground exhausted. After a while, having caught their breath, they stand up again and struggle on. Many stragglers look pale and sickly. They are completely exhausted. Suddenly a message comes from the head of the column. Relief. Village up ahead. That means water and something to eat. We summon our last resources and drag ourselves on. Soon we can see the houses. There are only a few, but there are also several barns belonging to a Kolkaz, just like we saw on the wide Russian steppes. There is a well in front of the first hut, with a windlass and a dented bucket. A Feldwebel stands a few feet from the well and waits until the first men get there. Those in front are dashing up to it, wanting to let the bucket down. Hold it, yells the Feldwebel. The man at the windlass lets go of the bucket, which now crashes down into the well. The Feldwebel suggests that the water may perhaps be poisoned. He goes up to one of the houses, one that has nice wooden carvings on the windows, and goes in the door. Not a soul can be seen. The Feldwebel reappears with a scruffy-looking fellow from the house. He is an old man with a bushy beard and is dressed in the typical quilted jacket. The Feldwebel is dragging him over to the well, holding onto his sleeve with two fingers. The bucket is now full of water, up from the well, and reflecting the gleaming sunlight. With a gesture of his hand towards the water, the Feldwebel now demands, Drink, Ruski. The old fellow looks at him with a crafty expression, smiles, and refuses several times, while repeatedly saying something like, Pan Karosh, Pan Karosh. The Feldwebel now becomes impatient. He grabs the old fellow by the neck and shoves his face in the bucket. The old boy chokes and swallows. He looks a bit surprised, but not too concerned. In other words, the water's safe. Okay, you can drink the water, says the Feldwebel. Bucketful after bucketful is now brought up, and the old fellow starts to grin. He has finally realized what this was all about. We wallow in the water, drinking all we can, and then use some to freshen up. The Kolkaz is a disappointment. We can't find any food anywhere. In one shed are a pile of mangled wurzels and a few ears of corn. Cooper bites a chunk of mangled wurzel, but spits it right out again. Meanwhile, a number of women have come out of the houses and are gawking at us. Weikert says the old Russian chap has mentioned something about a garrison headquarters and confiscation. That probably means that some German unit or other has already taken off with anything that's edible. The 28th of October. We march onwards with empty stomachs. Hour after hour passes. We sweat. We swear. Many of us shout out just to lighten our spirits. But we still have to drag ourselves forward, kilometer after kilometer. Then suddenly the peace of the countryside is broken by a dull, throbbing sound. Take cover! Air attack! Someone yells. We try to run for cover just as we have been trained to do, but after a couple of paces we go down on the spot. 
I scan the sky and, on the horizon, can pick out some aircraft coming towards us, their tails glinting in the sun. We can tell they're heavily loaded with bombs, ready for the kill. They are coming closer, then we can make out the cross insignia under their wings and realize that they're German bombers up on a mission, so we stand up and wave to them. They disappear in a northeasterly direction with their deadly cargo. That must be Stalingrad over there. We trudge on. How far is it now? asks little Grommel, who has made himself comfortable between me and Marzog. Marzog shrugs his shoulders. No idea, but I heard we're supposed to get there tomorrow. As if in answer, we hear a heavy muffled noise in the distance, followed by what sounds like rolling thunder. As it starts to get dark, we can see a red glare in the sky in the far distance. That's Stalingrad, someone says. What are those lights? Warius makes a gesture with his hand. We look towards where he is pointing and see a row of lights in the sky, just like lanterns. Then we hear more muffled explosions, and straight after that, we can see long, bright strings of pearls which start from the ground, continue up into the sky, and then disappear. Someone remarks, That's the runway raider. The old veteran explains that this is a light biplane, which generally operates at night over the runway, letting off flares suspended on little parachutes to illuminate targets. Then the plane drops a number of small bombs or fragmentation bombs. The pilot can turn off his engine and sail noiselessly towards his target like a glider. When the enemy discovers him, it's usually too late. The frontline troops have called him the name machine because that's what the engine sounds like. The old soldier goes on. By the way, those strings of pearls in the sky are tracer rounds from the 20 mm twin barrel and quad anti-aircraft guns, which are trying to shoot him down. It's a great show. More flares appear, and more strings of pearls follow in the night sky. It's odd, but we can't hear anything. It's like a silent movie. The 29th of October. A new morning is breaking, and our morale is at zero level. For an hour now, a fine drizzle has been coming down, and some of our men are quite outspoken about their dislike for it. The rain gets heavier, and now it's windy as well. For the first time, we are experiencing really lousy weather, something we hadn't expected. The gusts become stronger and stronger, and the open countryside offers no protection. The raindrops lash your face like fine needles, drumming against the steel helmets that we've put on to protect us. The wind tears at the ground sheets which we've wrapped around us, and they don't make much difference. They slap against our wet trousers and the cold wind practically knocks us off our feet. We trudge on. Several hours go by, then we finally spot a village. It has stopped raining. We find some empty barns and sink gratefully to the ground. It's quite busy in the village, with privates and other ranks all over the place. They snap to attention and salute each other. Have we reached the front line or not? There is plenty of evidence here that this area has been taken over by a headquarters and regimental staff. In other words, the Organisatorischen Schreibstubengefechtsstände, as Marzog puts it. Our transport Führer is supposed to be organizing some rations for us. It works. And we all receive a large helping of barley soup with meat chunks. They live quite well here. After the soup, we feel a lot better. What next? We wait, and we wait. Then there is an announcement. There are still eight or so kilometers to go. New strength is awakened in us. Although our bones ache and the blisters on our feet hurt, we manage to march the rest of the way in about an hour and a half. Quite an achievement considering the weight of our kit. Rumor has it that we will be picked up by vehicles from this point. However, they're not yet here, so again we have to wait. They arrive at dusk. We drive into the darkness, then over a long bridge with lots of other vehicles. The River Don, someone behind me remarks. Then we continue on the MSR, more commonly referred to as the runway. We drive without lights because of the runway raider. We can see his flares close up now, and can quite clearly hear the bangs as his bombs go off. After a few hours, we stop somewhere amongst some cottages. We are quartered in them for the night. In the distance, we hear the rolling thunder and the sky is glowing red. That's Stalingrad, all right. How is our enthusiasm compared to how we felt last week? It's definitely suffered because of the forced march we've just had to make, and we reckon that enthusiasm and euphoria are in short supply here. The reality is rather different. It's not something that gives you a good feeling at all. Well, we've reached the first stage towards our destination, 
and we'll now have to see how things work out. For the moment, though, I'm off to sleep to forget everything. <laughs>